Marx also came up with this idea, which is a crazy idea, as far as I can tell, of the, that's a technical term, crazy idea, <laughs> of, of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And that's the next idea that I really stumbled across. It was like, okay, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is the capitalists own everything. They own all the means of production. And they're oppressing everyone. And that would be all the workers. And there's going to be a race to the bottom of wages for the workers as the capitalists strive to extract more and more um, value from the labor of the proletariat by competing with other capitalists to drive wages downward, which, by the way, didn't happen, partly because wages, wage earners can become scarce, and that actually drives the market value upward. But the fact that, that you assume a priori that all the evil can be attributed to the capitalists and all the good that the bourgeoisie and all the good could be attributed to the proletariat meant that you could hypothesize that a dictatorship of the proletariat could come about and that was the, the the first stage in the communist revolution and remember this is a call for revolution and not just revolution but bloody violent revolution and the overthrow of all uh, the overthrowing of all existent social structures Um, anyways, the, 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 the problem with that, you see, is that because all the evil isn't divided so easily up into oppressor and oppressed, that when you do establish a dictator of the proletariat to the degree that you can do that, which you actually can't because it's technically impossible and an absurd thing to consider to begin with, not least because of the problem of centralization, I mean, you have to hypothesize that you can take away all the property of the capitalists you can replace the capitalist class with a minority of pro proletariats. How they're going to be chosen isn't exactly clear in the Communist Manifesto. That none of the people who are from the proletariat class are going to be corrupted by that sudden access to power because they're, well, by definition, good. So, so then you have the good people who are running the world and you also have them centralized so that they can make decision decisions that are insanely complicated to make, in, in fact, impossibly complicated to make. And so that's a failure conceptually on both dimensions because, first of all, all the proletariat aren't going to be good. And when you give, put people in the same position as the evil capitalists, especially if you believe that social pressure is one of the determining factors of human character, which the Marxists certainly believe, then why wouldn't you assume that the proletariat would immediately become as or more corrupt than the capitalists, which is, of course, I would say exactly what happened every time this experiment was run. And then the, the next problem is, well, what makes you think that you can take some system as complicated as like capitalist free market society and centralize that and put decision making power in the hands of a few people, the mechanisms by without specifying the mechanisms by which you're going to choose them. Like, what makes you think they're going to have the wisdom or the ability to do what the capitalists were doing, unless you assume, as Marx did, that all of the evil was with the capitalists and all the good was with the proletariats, and that nothing that capitalists did constituted valid labor, which is another thing that Marx assumed, which is palpably absurd. Because people who are, like, maybe if you're a, dissolute aristocrat from 1830 and or earlier and you run a feudal estate and all you do is spend your time gambling and and and, and chasing prostitutes well then the your labor value is zero but if you're if you're running a business and and it's a successful business first of all you're a bloody fool to explo exploit your workers because even if you're greedy as sin because you're not going to extract the maximum amount of labor out of them by doing that and the notion that you're adding no productive value as a manager rather than a capitalist is it's absolutely absurd all it does is indicate that you either know nothing whatsoever about how an actual business works or you refuse to know anything about how an actual business works so that's That's also, a, that's also a big problem. So then the next problem is the criticism of profit. It's like, well, wh what's wrong with profit exactly? What, what's the problem with profit? Well, the idea from the Marxist perspective was that profit was theft. 
you know, but profit, well, can be theft because crooked people can run companies, and so sometimes profit is theft, but that certainly doesn't mean that it's always th theft. What it means, in part at least, if the capitalist is adding value to the corporation, then there's some utility and some fairness in him or her extracting the value of their abstract labor, their thought, their abstract abilities, their ability to manage the company and to engage in proper competition and product development and efficiency and the proper treatment of the workers and all of that. And then if they can create a profit, well then they have a little bit of security for times that aren't so good and that seems absolutely bloody necessary as far as I'm concerned. And then the next thing is, well, how can you grow if you don't have a profit? And if you have an enterprise that's valuable and worthwhile, and some enterprises are valuable and worthwhile, then it seems to me that a little bit of profit to help you grow seems to be the right approach. And so, and then the other issue with profit, and you know this if you've ever run a business, is it's a really useful constraint. You know, like, it's not enough to have a good idea. It's not a good, enough to have a good idea and a sales and marketing plan and then to implement that and all of that, that's bloody difficult. Like it's not e good, easy to have a good idea and it's not easy to come up with a good sales and marketing plan and it's not easy to find customers and satisfy them. And so if you allow profit to, to constitute a limitation on what it is that you might reasonably attempt, it provides a good constraint on, on wasted labor. And so most of the things that I've done in my life, even psychologically, that were designed to help people's psychological health, I tried to run on a for-profit basis. And the reason for what that was, apart from the fact that I'm not averse to making a profit, partly so my enterprises can grow, but was also so that there were forms of stupidity that I couldn't engage in because I would be punished by the market enough to eradicate the enterprise. And so... Okay, and then, so, the next, the next issue, this is a weird one. So, Marx and Engels also assume that this dictatorship of the proletariat, which involves absurd centralization, the overwhelming probability of corruption, and impossible computation, as the proletariat now try to rationally compute the manner in which an entire market economy could run, which cannot be done, because it's far too complicated for anybody to think through, um, the next theory is that somehow the proletariat dictatorship would become magically hyperproductive. And there's actually no theory at all about how that's going to happen. And so I had to infer the theory, and the theory seems to be that once you eradicate the bourgeoisie, because they're evil, and you get rid of their private property, and you, 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 you eradicate the profit motive, then all of a sudden, magically, the small percentage of the proletariat who now run the society determine how they can make their productive enterprises productive enough so they become hyperproductive. Now, and they need to become hyperproductive for the last error to be logically coherent in relationship to the Marxist theory, which is that at some point the proletariat, the dictatorship of the proletariat, will become so hyperproductive that there'll be enough material goods for everyone across all dimensions. And when that happens, then what people will do is spontaneously engage in meaningful creative labor, which is what they had been alienated from in the capitalist horror show, and the utopia will be magically ushered in. But there's no indication about how that hyperproductivity is going to come about, and there's, no also, there's also no understanding that, well, that isn't the utopia that is going to suit everyone because there are great differences between people and some people are going to find what they want in love and some are going to find it in social being and some are going to find it in conflict and competition and some are going to find it in creativity as Marx pointed out but the notion that that, that will necessarily be the end goal for the utopian state is preposterous. And then there's the Dostoevskyan observation too, which is one not to be taken lightly, which is, well, what sort of shallow conception of people do you have 
that makes you think that if you gave people enough bread and cake and the Dostoevsky in terms and nothing to do with busy them to bu except to busy themselves with the continuity continuity of the species that they would also all of a sudden become peaceful and heavenly Dostoevsky's idea was that you know we were built for trouble and if we were ever handed everything we were we needed on a silver platter the first thing we would do is engage in some form of creative destruction just so something unexpected could happen just so we could have the adventure of our lives and I think there's something well there's something to be said for that so and then the last error let's say although by no means the last was this and this is one of the strangest parts of the communist manifesto is Marx admits and Engels admit repeatedly in the communist manifesto that there has never been a system of production in the history of the world that was as effective at producing material commodities in excess than capitalism like that's that's extensively documented in the communist manifesto and so if your proposition is look we got to get as much material security for everyone as we as, as possible as fast as we can and capitalism already seems to be doing that at a rate that's unparalleled in human history wouldn't the logical thing be just to let the damn system play itself out I mean unless you're assuming that the evil capitalists are just going to take all of the flat screen televisions and put them in one big room and not let anyone else have one the, the logical assumption is that well you're already on a road that's supposed to produce the proper material productivity and so well that's ten reasons as far as I can tell that and so what I saw in that 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 the communist manifesto is is like seriously flawed in in virtually every way it could possibly be flawed and also all in and in and uh, 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 evidence that Marx was the kind of narcissistic thinker who could think he was he was a very intelligent person and so was Engels but what he thought what he thought when he thought was that what he thought was correct and he never went the second stage which is well, wait a second how could all of this go terribly wrong and if you're a thinker, especially a sociological thinker, especially a thinker on the broad scale, a, a social scientist, for example, one of your moral obligations is to think, you know, you might be wrong about one of your fundamental axioms, or two, or three, or ten. And as a consequence, you have the moral obligation to walk through the damn system and think, well, what if I'm completely wrong here and things invert and go exactly the wrong way and like I can't I just can't understand how anybody could come up with an idea like the dictatorship of the proletariat especially after advocating its implementation for with violent means which is a direct part of the communist manifesto and actually think if they were thinking if they knew anything about human beings and the proclivity for malevolence that's part and parcel of the individual human being that that could do anything but lead to a special form of hell which is precisely what did happen and so I'm going to close because I have three minutes with with the, a bit of evidence as well that um, Marx also thought that what would happen inevitably as a consequence of capitalism is the rich would get richer and the poor would get poorer so there would be inequality the first thing I'd like to say is we do not know how to set up a human system of economics without inequality no one has ever managed it including the communists and the form of in inequality changed and it's not obvious by any stretch of imagination that the free market economies of the West have more inequality than the less free economies in the rest of the world and the one thing you can say about capitalism is that although it produces inequality which it absolutely does it also produces wealth and all the other systems don't they just produce inequality <laughs> So here's here's a few stats. Here's a few free market stats, okay? Um, from 1800 to 2017, income growth adjusted for inflation grew by 40 times by, for production workers and 16 times for unskilled labor. Um, well, GDP fact GDP rose by a factor of about 0.5 from 1 AD to 1800. So from 1 AD to 1800 AD, it was like nothing flat and then all of a sudden in the last 200 and 
and 17 years, there's been this unbelievably upward movement of wealth. And it doesn't only characterize the tiny percentage of people at the top who, admittedly, do have most of the wealth. The question is, not only though, what's the inequality? The question is, well, what's happening to the absolutely poor at the bottom? And the answer to that is, they're getting richer faster now than they ever have in the history of the world. And we're eradicating poverty in countries that have adopted moderate free market policies at a rate that's unparalleled. So here's an example. The UN millennial, one of the UN millennial goals to, was to reduce the, the rate of absolute poverty in the world by 50% between 2000 and 2015. And they defined that as $1.90 a day. Pretty low, you know, uh, but you have to start somewhere. Um, we, be, we, we hit that at 2012, three years ahead of schedule. And you might be cynical about that and say, well, it's kind of an arbitrary number, but the curves are exactly the same at $3.80, $3.80 a day and $7.60 a day. Not as many people have hit that, but the rate of increase towards that is the same. The bloody UN thinks that we'll be out of poverty defined by $1.90 a day by the year 2030. It's unparalleled. And so... So the, so the rich may be getting richer, but the poor are getting richer too. And that's, that's not the... Look, I'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> because I'm out of time. But one of the, I'll, I'll leave it with this. Um, <laughs> the poor are not getting poor under capitalism. The poor are getting richer under capitalism. <laughs> by a large margin. And I'll leave you with one statistic, which is that now... Um, in, in Africa, the child mortality rate in Africa now is the same as the child mortality rate was in Europe in 1952. And so that's happened within the span of one lifetime. And so if you're for the poor, if you're for the poor, if you're actually concerned that the poorest people in the world rise above their starvation levels, then the, all the evidence suggests that the best way to do that is to implement something approximating a free market economy.